Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians. Each will be one to one. Today's guest was a public defender and a traditional union organizer before she formed her own union, one that more and more New Yorkers are relying on. It's the Freelancers Union, which serves the needs of independent workers, the freelancers, consultants, independent contractors, temps, part-timers, contingent employees, and self-employed people who now comprise more than 30% of the nation's workforce. While politicians and health care providers parse the merits of several health care plans, for many New Yorkers, the discussion is irrelevant because health insurance has been out of their reach. Enter Sarah Horowitz. I'm delighted you could join us today. Well, thank you. Sarah, your family has a long history of working with labor. Your father was a labor lawyer and your grandfather was a vice president of the Ladies Garment Workers Union. Was it inevitable that you would wind up working on behalf of labor? Um, it's sort of um, an interesting thing, this inevitability question. I think it was definitely the familiar path, and I have to say when I was younger I thought you could either be a union organizer or a worker, and that was about it. Um, of course, later I realized maybe you could add two or three things to that. But no, I think that it's a, a way of looking at the world about um, how is it that people work, how does our society work, and those were the kinds of questions I think I always grew up with. So what were some of the major influences on you when you were growing up? It's a funny combination, I think, of um, l knowing labor as a history, but in a kind of DNA sort of way. And then I went to Quaker schools, and I think Quakerism turned out to be a huge influence in terms of being an individual and, a, and having a responsibility to to do things. And Quakers that, have a big history of activism. Yes, for sure. So, And it was also during the time of the Vietnam War. So uh, Bayard Rustin used to come to our school. And it really taught me a lot about not just the responsibility of acting when you see that there's something important to do, that you as an individual have to do that, but that that was a realistic thing, that that was something you could do. And the labor movement was really something that I grew up in. My grandmother lived in union housing. Really? And uh, the amalgamated housing. Down in the 20s? Um, actually on the Lower East Side. Okay. And, um, th and I always knew that labor played a really important role in the democracy. I wouldn't have put it like that, but I knew that that was the way that you could make change. And just growing up, I was born in 1963, and I had just, in, at a very young age, seen so many movements between Vietnam War, civil rights, feminist, environmental, gay rights movements. And so I think the idea of social movements wasn't something that was abstract to me or that it was um, impossible or that you should be cynical. It just seemed to me that you had to actually have the right ingredients and, and work for it and mm -hmm. organize for that. Now, you started out as a public defender. How, did, how was that? What was that like? And how did you make the transition from public defender to into the labor area? Actually, I had been working for a union since I was 18 years old. I got a job strictly through nepotism at the Ladies' Garment Workers Union, where I worked um, as a receptionist and did all sorts of things and then worked for a lot of different unions. And so by the time, and I went to the labor school at Cornell. And so by the time I had gone to law school, I thought I should really try something different. So, so you actually had an undergraduate major in labor? Yes. And worked um, just for a, a lot of different unions at every opportunity, helped uh, the Cornell workers who were trying to unionize at the time while I was there. and. So I became a public defender in New York City, a criminal defense lawyer, and then also the shop steward for my union. So I ended up back doing union things just as a lawyer. So at that point, I just said, this is the, my life's path, and so went to work for a law firm that represented the healthcare workers union. And I'm sure that uh, public defenders really needed some union representation, you know, oh, considering yeah. what they were probably were paid and probably still are paid. Yeah, for sure. So you went to work, I know, you were an organizer with Local 1199 of the Healthcare and Human Services Employees Union, which has long had a lot of political clout in New York City, I guess because of its um, its longtime head, Dennis Rivera. Is that one of the reasons, was the political clout, the political influence, one of the reasons you joined that union as opposed to others? Yeah, I mean, when I graduated, I knew 
from college, that is. I knew I wanted to be a union organizer. And they really were, and still are, now they're SEIU, you know, the preeminent organizers. They really knew how to do it. And it was before Dennis Rivera was Leon Davis. And, you know, what was really fascinating as a New Yorker is that we're not accustomed to, um, not just as New Yorkers, but probably as Americans, recognizing how when people stick together, they can do enormous things. And when you think about who are and were the healthcare workers, they were black Puerto Rican women. And that they could come together and be a political force in New York, if not the United States, I think it was a pretty shocking thing. And so growing up, within New York, and really that's the union I was an organizer for, I was a lawyer for, I think it really taught me just the brass tacks of how you do things. You know, it wasn't all abstract, big picture conversation. It really was about actually getting things done and organizing. And when I left college, I worked in a nursing home as a dietary aide, um, and which I was terrible at, but I tried really hard. Um, but at any rate, so we helped unionize that nursing home. And that was also hugely interesting in terms of understanding what workers go through in an organizing drive in order to start thinking about how to build a, a new kind of union. Now, nursing home workers are notoriously ill-treated. Are they unionized at this point at all? Yes. In fact, 1199 has most of, of the nursing okay. homes, and they have organized that industry, not entirely, but really, again, transformed it. And you know, one thing I always think, I went to the Kennedy School as well, and I would listen frequently to people talk about public policy and anti-poverty programs, and I think, why don't we think about unions as an anti-poverty program? You think about 1199, and the women who were working in, in these hospitals and nursing homes would frequently have spells of going on welfare because the wages were so low. Right. And once they were unionized, they didn't go back on welfare. So it meant to the tax base of New York City and the taxpayers that they didn't have to pay welfare because here was a whole group of people who had become workers. Right. And that is something that's always struck me as we have discussions about the declining middle class and what's happening to the distribution of income. You know, it's as if we really need to call again for a resurgence of the labor movement and support in recognizing that we actually have a tool and a vehicle to do these things. Well, union, unionization has really declined in this country. I think it's down to about perhaps 14 percent of all workers, 9 percent of privately employed workers. Yeah, in fact, it's now seven and a half percent. Is it percent. really? Yeah, and I think that that is a new era because the difference between seven and a half and zero just isn't that much. And you realize that, A, we have a labor movement now that's largely in the public sector. And, you know, there's, there's really no democracy that exists that doesn't have an active labor movement. So we should really be viewing that as something very negative, not a positive. You have described the freelancers' union as part of the third wave of unionism. Mm -hmm. What were the first and second, and what's, what's the third wave? Um, there are probably 18 waves, but the biggest buckets are, the first was the craft union movement after the Industrial Revolution, where business had changed, and we started having craft workers and factories, and we started having 14-hour days, children working, and we as a society, through the labor movement, started saying that that wasn't going to be the way that our democracy was going to be. And through the labor movement and many, many other uh, nonprofit settlement house groups, we started having a progressive era. And the second wave would really be mass production, the big factories in the 1930s, uh, really after World War I. And that led to industrial unionism, like the auto workers, steel workers. And that, again, brought mass production, largely immigrant workers, and we started saying we need to start having a way that we can have a more civilized democracy, and we brought about the New Deal. And now we have people who are working, they're going from job to job and project to project. It's across the economic spectrum, and we really can't just unionize at the job because people aren't at their jobs in order to engage in a collective bargaining arrangement. Frequently, they have three jobs. There are often many employers, and really it makes sense to go back looking at different models from labor history to think about what would be the next form of unionism. We know it has to be portable. It has to stay with the individual. We have to have benefits that are connected to the individual, and those individuals have to form new groups, because one thing that we know is that when it's just the individual to an insurance company, 
that individual no really leverage, has no, no leverage. Cloud. And it's the same for individuals to government. And I actually think that's something that people have almost forgotten. In some ways, we've internalized the worldview of Ronald Reagan. So we think that we'll just deliver health insurance as an individual to the government or retirement, the individual, to the financial companies like Fidelity. But we do so much better when we join together. We can get more things, not just in markets, but also as advocates. So how did the, how did the Freelancers Union come about? So basically, I was, as, I was working as a, a lawyer uh, for 1199, the Healthcare Workers Union, and I, it's, to me, has always been and still is one of the best unions in the country. But I could see that there was something about the way that people were working that just didn't fit the traditional union model. And at that point, I had been a, an organizer, a labor lawyer. I had been working for a union since I was 18. And I wouldn't say that I had anything near an analysis that I could have explained at the time. It was almost an intuition. And started thinking, you know, we really have to start thinking about what this next form of unionism is going to be. And so I uh, went off for kind of like an intellectual sabbatical at the Kennedy School uh, to really think about it and started really thinking about what, uh, what are the essential things? What does really make a union a union? And really, it's about people coming together and having a revenue model. You must have a way to make money so that the union is not dependent on foundations or the government. And when you get those two key things right, you can start building a lot of things and started bringing workers together and found their number one issue was health insurance. And thinking, how hard could that be? Well, it turned out that was the string that really showed how the New Deal was unraveling. And from there, really started building And it the started union. in what year? The basic, just the idea phase was really 95 and 96. Mm -hmm. And then the model that really worked was what we call the Portable Benefits Network, which started right after 9-11. Okay. Well, you'll tell us more about that uh, after we take a quick break. Uh, Sarah Horowitz, founder of the Freelancers Union, and I will be back. Hello, I'm Della Reese, and I'd like you to meet Faith in Action. Faith in action means people keep their independence by getting help from volunteers, people of different faiths who shop, cook, drive, or just check in on some of the millions of Americans with long-term health care needs. A neighbor's independence depends on you and me. Faith in action. Try it and see how good it feels. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, talking with Sarah Horowitz, founder and executive director of the Freelancers Union. So, how do you organize independent workers? And how do you, how do you make that work financially? How does a union sustain itself that way? Well, the first thing is to really focus on what is the central issue of concern to people. And at that time, it was really health insurance because people didn't work for one employer and they earn too much to get benefits from the government. So the idea was to start figuring out what could we do together at the time. And insurance has been a long tradition of, of unionism, of bringing people together and also engaging in an advocacy discussion about what does this next safety net look like. And so we started to uh, have meetings and educational programs and the benefits and then that really is what took off in terms of the numbers. And because of the changes in technology, you could really see that you couldn't have had this form of unionism 25 or 30 years ago because Without the internet. you need the internet. And the internet actually, not just because it's such a great vehicle to reach people, but by its very structure, it is based on social networks. And freelancers, because they're working from job to job and project to project, have very interesting and strong social networks. And so when you bring them together, A, with a tangible agenda for advocacy and tangible benefits, 
and you create a way to bring them together, that allows them to act very much like a traditional union in one place. Suddenly, you might not collect, engage in collective bargaining at the workplace, but you're engaging in bargaining for health insurance, disability, life insurance, bringing people together to meet their elected officials, policymakers, educating policymakers that freelancers, for instance, are completely falling out of the safety net. Now, that you started out, you had some benefactors, you had some foundation support. Oh, definitely. Um, and did, do you have, are you a dues collecting organization? Well, let me just say um, a bunch of things. One thing is that we definitely started out being supported by foundations. But interestingly, because this was not done in the traditional way, a lot of groups wanted, a lot of funders wanted it to be more um, sort of political first, really didn't understand the benefits of benefits. Uh, most of the funders walked away, actually. and. I was lucky enough to be part of the social entrepreneurial movement, and so my first funder just funded me. And uh, I started just being able to move an idea based on logic and strategy rather than just having to respond to that. So the foundation's uh, Echoing Green was our first funder, and then eventually the Ford Foundation came in and really helped with capitalizing this. It's and interesting. I know, I think the Ford Foundation found, was, was instrumental in starting the first, I don't know if it was a union, but the first re, uh, pension benefits for college and university teachers. Yeah, you know, it was actually Andrew Carnegie. Ah. And he said that... Sorry, Carnegie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that professors were, were filming, finishing their career in penury, and so he started coming up with a pension system, which was what's now TIAA Craft, right. the sophisticated realization that people were going from project to project. And that's another thing that's different. So we don't have dues. We start where anybody can join. It's completely free. You go to our website, uh, freelancersunion.org, and then as you need products or services, if you want to come to an educational program, then you pay a fee. And what it does is it enables people to get that which they need and also to then become part of, of something larger than themselves or to simply just get benefits. Sort of sort of like, is it similar to the AARP it, model? Yes. Well, AARP was really a first good model for this because I think they understood the idea of a, how you were going to bring people together, how it was going to pay for itself and how it could be a really important advocacy force. But what we're trying to do is to eventually move it so that people start having an ability to start running their own union. And that's a big difference from AARP, is that we want people to be able to start voting for their own elected positions and really trying to move in that direction. And that is something that we're working on now. And we have 65,000 members, uh, over 50,000. Over 50,000 are in New York. We're actually the fourth largest union in New York City. And our membership is across the country, but really in a bunch of states. Do California, you have New a Jersey. union president and officers? Well, we're moving toward that. I mean, that's the, exactly what we're looking at. We just went to northern Italy looking at the cooperative movement there and looking at how they're structured because you have to figure out where are people expert in different things? How is it that people will be able to participate so that they'll have, um, they'll be in a, the right position to know what it is they want and be able to have some kind of representation. So what's the average income of your union, of your member? The biggest group earns between 25 and 50,000. Mm -hmm. And they're really the declining middle class. They work as freelancers in ways that people might expect, graphic artists, film and television, but in ways that people maybe wouldn't expect. They're security guards, domestic workers, financial planners. We have a lot of people who work in manufacturing in New York because manufacturing relies on early stage design and different uh, craft types of work. Uh, we very much sit beside the industrial and craft union model of people who aren't in the traditional labor mm -hmm. movement. And so part of this is being a part of what this next labor movement will be, not replacing anything that existed. So how are you able to, I mean, you, you offer health insurance now. How are you able to set that up with the insurance companies? 
Well, early on, it was very hard because we really had to demonstrate that we were already a group. And what was difficult was finding an insurance company that actually thought that was a good idea. Now, you know, we have 16, over 16,000 people who get insurance from us, so there's actually a lot more interest on the part of the insurance industry because they're realizing that these kinds of groups are good groups. But we continually try to respond, not just for health insurance. We provide disability, dental insurance, dental discounts. And now we're working on the next model of unemployment insurance. Because if you're a freelancer, you are not eligible for unemployment. And yet, if you talk to freelancers, their number one issue is finding work and the feast and famine of that work. So, and who would you negotiate that with, with? Would you negotiate with that with the federal government? Well, we're actually looking at starting a state model. And, you know, interestingly enough, New York was the pioneer of the New Deal. It was piloted in New York and then brought nationally through FDR. And what we want to do is start uh, an unemployment system that's like an income stabilization fund that people would be able to put away pre-tax dollars and get some matching funds, and then they start having their own account that they could use to level their income. Mm -hmm. Then show that that's actually something that has to happen. Look at what's happening right now. We need an economic stimulus of the economy. We can't exactly figure out how to get workers what they need quickly. But this is something that would affect a third of the workforce. If you did it nationally, you'd get money into the hands of consumers really fast. So would that be partly uh, money for unemployed, when you're unemployed, and partly just retirement savings, a combination? Well, no, the, the retirement sa another thing we're launching in September is actually a first group retirement plan. But this would function as being able to put away money knowing that your income is uneven you know that your rent or your mortgage check or your tuition or your student loan comes monthly on time. You don't know whether the money you're going to get for your gigs is going to come. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to figure that out. You also don't get time off for vacations. So people just often don't take vacations or they don't, they just feel they can't plan for them. So if people could just have something that would let them plan, it would give them economic security, and have a role for government which would enable them to have such things as regular employees have when they're able to buy into the unemployment system. And so we're looking at unemployment, we're creating a retirement fund, health insurance. We're really, in effect, recreating the concepts of the New Deal, but for this part of the workforce, and making sure that it's something that's sustainable. When we've looked at our membership, 92 percent are registered to vote, 87 percent have voted in national elections. They're a really interesting, entrepreneurial group of people. Uh, they're, uh, freelancers, by their nature, have to stay at the top of their game because they're always hustling for work. And so they're just an engaged group. They're often working from home, so they're really engaged in their community. And they're the group that will bring about the next safety net. Just as when you go and you look at the social movements of the past, not only did the group, whether it was for civil rights or women's rights or environmental or gay rights, change for their own community, they transformed the society. And this is going to be the group that's going to transform society in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. Are there other things that you offer that the free, uh, your union um an independent workers union offers to its members other than the specific benefits? Is there camaraderie? Is there political organization? What? Well, one thing that we have done is we have a partnership with Meetup, and we have over 50 meetups happening of freelancers across the country. And we now have a staff person who's starting to coordinate the meetups so that we'll be able to join together for uh, political work. We just What's a meetup? So the meetups are uh, ways, do you remember, uh, people can come together, they can be freelancer moms, and they'll have a meeting, or Brooklyn freelancers, or different kinds of graphic artists freelancers, and they can come together, go online to the freelancers union and find a meetup in their area or start a meetup. We also have monthly educational plans uh, and groups, and those are from marketing yourself, uh, to paying your taxes, financial planning. We've done events where people, we just met with uh, the Commissioner Patricia Smith, the Secretary of Labor for New York State, talking about the need for a new unemployment system. We've met with Controller Thompson. Uh, uh, um, and our goal is to start 
having our members engage as freelancers talking about what they need. And uh, so far, our members have received very warm uh, support from uh, Chris Quinn, the speaker, uh, and, um, and Congressman Weiner. So it's really been very interesting, Congressman so where Adler. Do you, where do you see the union being, say, five, ten years from now? Well, really, nationally, we'll be in significant and key cities and states and being able to have a constituency that cannot just say what it needs, but can follow through with the things that you need to do to deliver the votes to get things to change, and to have a model that makes them independent, not dependent on foundations, not dependent on government, not dependent on employers, but independent and strong. And this will be the social movement, and it will be working with many different groups that are related. So I, it's, a, to me, an incredibly exciting time and one that's already starting to show that we have the ability to, to really change things. And I may very well find myself a part, needing you, a part of it at some point. Well, very we interesting. would love to have you. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're out of time. But I want to thank Sarah Horowitz for joining me. For the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.